Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and this is our continuing series of YouTube videos to help people enjoy chess better, play chess better, understand chess better, improve at chess, that kind of thing. All right, in today's video, I thought I'd do something that uh, I don't see talked about very often, which is the effect that your language in what you're thinking affects what's happening on the board. And we're going to start with the most basic type of language, which is simply naming things. And what, what are things that are named in chess? Well, one of the things that's named in chess, every opening has a name. So, for instance, we understand the names. Like, let's say, you know, 500 years ago, or however many years it was, uh, Roy Lopez, the uh, Spanish uh, clergyman, writes about this opening e4 e5 knight f3 knight c6 bishop b5 and we name it after him so we call this opening the Roy Lopez that's perfectly understandable um, how did we get dragon well in the Sicilian when white plays knight f3 d6 d4 c takes d4 knight takes d4 knight f6 knight c3 g6 well, this gets its name from the fact that the pawn structure looks like a little dragon here. So instead of naming it after a person, you know, we named it after the pawn structure there. And, you know, we give things names. It helps us remember them. It helps us recognize them, which is good. And these names can change over the years. When I was a beginner and people played e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, e5. I think we called this something like the pelican or the maybe the Labourdonnais vari variation. But a few years after that, uh, an international master in the Soviet Union, Sveshnikov, studied this opening and decided it was better for black than most people had thought it was. And he began to uh, you know, give a lecture at the Moscow Club about this opening. And he began to play it all the time. And eventually he became a grandmaster and the other players began to realize that he was right. And today nobody calls it the Pelican anymore. We call it the Sveshnikov variation named after Grandmaster Sveshnikov who popularized it in the, that kind of, you know, circa 1970 time frame. So, you know, things get names this way. Um, Here's an interesting case. Uh, suppose also in the Sicilian, when I first started out, if black played these following moves, let's say d6, d4, c takes d, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, knight c6, this position was not given a name. We waited for white's next move. If white played bishop g5, we called it a Richter Ruser. If white played bishop c4, we called it a Sozin. And on bishop e2, if black chooses to play e5, then that was a Boleslavsky, I believe. Well, some years later, I think Batsford was writing a book about this position, and they wanted to talk about, you know, we're going to talk about all these possibilities in one book, but now we need to know the name of the book. So what should we call it? And they decided to call it the classical variation of the Sicilian. So when I started out, we didn't call this the classical variation. But within 10, 15 years, you know, it was called classical variation. All right, so openings can have names, but a lot of things can have names. Maneuvers can have names. For instance, suppose you attack a pawn with a pawn. All right, well, the name a lot of people use here, and Hans Kamak uses it in his book Pawn, Power, and Chess, is called a lever. When a pawn attacks a pawn, it's a lever. Okay, but Hans Kamak wanted to talk about a particular type of lever, and that is what happens when you create a lever against a pawn that can't move past you. In the, in the example we just gave with c5, white can go past with d5, so that's a nice lever. But what happens if white plays d4 and black plays d5, and now white plays c4? The idea is that black can't stop white from trading off these pawns if he wants to. So in his book written in the 1940s, Hans Kmach, who has a lot of arcane language in his wonderful book, called this a liberating lever 
because it, it liberates the pieces. It opens up lines for the rooks and the queens and the bishop. So he calls it a liberating lever. But 20 years later, by the time I started playing tournament chess, the chess players had already come up with a name for this that was not liberating lever. They called it a pawn break, or just for short, a break move. So this was called a break move. And it's been called that ever since. If Hans Kamak had written his book 20 or 30 years later, he would have still called a pawn against a pawn attack a lever, but he would have said, and if we want to play a lever against a fixed pawn, that's a break move. I don't think he would have made up a new term if it had already had existed. A break move. Okay, so we've got names for that. Um, you know, we a lot of times we borrow names from, you know, other languages. For instance, uh, let's clear the board and let's say we put a white king on e6 and a white pawn on e7 and a black king on e8 and now we play king to f6 and it's black's move well black doesn't want to move he wants to just stay on e8 and keep blocking that pawn forever but the rules of chess says he's bound to move and in chess in english we would say he's bound to move he's forced to move but in german they have a one word name that means move bound which is Zugzwang which the, the word Z-U-G, I think, in German means move, Zug, and then Z-W-A-N-G, I guess, means bound. And it's, the Z is pronounced like a T-S in English, so it's Zugzwang. So black is in Zugzwang, and, you know, people remember Zugzwang, or if you're in English and you don't know how to pronounce it, a lot of people call it Zugzwang. <laughs> He's in Zugzwang. He's in Zugzwang. So, so yes, that helps you identify it helps you remember this idea that when you give it a name it 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 gives it something to work with and this idea of giving things names is very important you know w when i created the idea of counting i needed a good name um, the idea being that it this idea had existed forever this analysis idea that when you're counting the tactic of seeing whether you're going to win material or lose material by a series of trades you know, that type of tactic, I needed a name, and I, I couldn't find a really good name for it, but I thought I would call it counting, which sometimes gets confused with other things, but that's okay. I mean, I needed a name. And I wrote to Dr. John Nunn, who I guess had been involved with calling that variation of the Sicilian, the classical Sicilian. And I said, Dr. Nunn, I hear some problems in your book, uh, Learn Chess Tactics, which you called miscellaneous, and I would like to give it a name, this idea of of figuring out capturing sequences to win material. I would like to call this tactic counting. What do you think? And Dr. Nunn said, sounds like a good as name as any. And I felt very good that Dr. Nunn had given it his approval. And I went ahead and, and called it that. So I gave it a name. Um, let's, let's talk about another type of name here. There's just so many ways to talk about this. It's kind of interesting. Um, let's say you're attacking something like so. Let's clear the board. And let's put a pawn over here. And it's guarded by a pawn, and you're attacking it with a pawn, and you're also attacking it with the queen here. So I get to these kind of positions, and I say to my students, you know, we're trying to figure out if this e5 pawn is safe. And one of the things you want to do to figure out if something is safe is ask, how many times is it attacked, and how many times is it guarded? And I say to them, how many times is this pawn on e5 attacked? And a lot of my students say, one. And I say, one? And they say, yes, just one. And I say, well, what one is the one attacking it? And they say, the pawn. And I say, nothing else is attacking it? And they say, no. And I said, why isn't the queen attacking it? And they say, because the queen can't jump over the pawn and take the pawn. And of course, they're correct. That's true. But if we're counting the issue of safety on e5, then when white takes the pawn and black takes back, the queen can take the pawn. So we have to count the queen, even though the queen can't capture first. The general name for this, which is not well talked about in the various books on safety and tactics, is called an indirect attack. But the word indirect seems a little vague. It doesn't really describe what's happening here. So one day I was teaching a young student. Most of my students are adults, but this was a younger student, maybe about you know 12 years old or something. And <clears throat> I, we were going through this, and I said to him, you know, how many times is the pawn attacked? He said one, and so on and so forth. And I said, well, you know, 
this is like a, an, an indirect attack. And he says, he said, I would like to name this attack. And I said, okay. And he sa I said, what would you like to call it? And he says, I want to call it a glory attack. And I said, a glory attack? And he said, yeah. I said, why glory? He says, well, my dog's name is glory, and that'll help me remember it. So he says, I'm going to call it a glory attack. And I said, okay. So this is well known, I guess, as an indirect attack. Uh, but at least to one person, it's, it's a glory attack. But again, the idea is we're giving it some sort of name. Okay, let's, um, let's look at an end game. All right, how about we have a king on, well, let's put the king on c8, and we have a pawn on c7, and we have a uh, rook on b1 and a rook on c2. Okay. So this is a very famous endgame. It can be reached a lot of times when you have a rook and a pawn against a rook and you can get your king in front of the pawn. A lot of times you can slowly work its way down the board till you get to some position like this. And this position is given a name which helps people remember it and it's a very well-known name. It's called the Lucena position. And in the Lucena position, you know, there's a certain sequence of things that you do. For instance, you start out by checking the king and now the king has four different squares to go to and we're not going to go through the entire Lucena but basically if he goes king to d to d6 you can play king up and now he can't take the pawn because you check him and when he plays here you check him again and when he goes out of the way you take the rook so it's a kind of removal of the guard so after rook e1 check e king d6 king d8 White's just threatening to get a queen and he's going to win. The main line is to play king to f7 and then the famous rook lift kind of move, creating a, uh, la a little ladder here, rook to e4, Lucena. Okay, so we, we again, we have names for these things. Um, names, as I said, help you remember this, Lucena, uh, there's other end games that have names. Now let's look at puzzles that have names. You know, famous problems are named after their composer, or maybe they're named after the idea. Let's uh, show maybe the world's most famous puzzle. Uh, do 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 do. White's king is on uh, h8. Black has a pawn on h5. White is a pawn on c6, and black has a pawn on king on a6. White to play and draw. This is maybe the world's most famous puzzle. And this was created by Grandmaster Richard Reddy. So, of course, we call it the Reddy problem. Okay. Um, let's see. We have names of tactical patterns. Okay. A tactical pattern is, um, let's see, try 22, examine... All right, this is a famous tactic, okay? The tactic is queen c4 check, king h8, knight f7 check, king g8, knight h6 double check, king h8, queen g8 check, rook takes g8, knight f7. So I ask people, what's the name of this tactic? And a lot of people say smothered mate. And I go, no, that's the, that's the name of the kind of mate at the end. And I say, if this is smothered mate, then, you know, what, what's e4, c6, d4, d5, knight c3, d takes e, knight takes e4, knight d7, queen e2, knight eight, f6, knight c6, knight to d6. And they say, well, that's also smothered mate. And I go, yes, it is. But that's because that's the type of mate it is, not the name of the combination. This is a completely different combination than the one we looked at before. And then they say, no, I don't know. And the name of this combination, queen c4, king h8, knight f7, king g8, knight h6, double check, king h8, queen g8, check, rook g8, knight f7. Some other mate is, the name of the combination is Philidor's Legacy. Philidor's Legacy. So we have names of, of 
you know, combinations. Here's a combination called Philip. We have end games with names. We have combinations with names. Um, people love to give names to things. I mean, I have a book here called Unorthodox Chess Openings, and I'm going to open to a random page. And we all know that the London opening is d4, and then black would play something like d5 and bishop f4. But what's the London defense? Well, in this opening, the London defense against the spike opening is g4, e5, h3, knight c6, bishop g2, d5. He calls that the London defense. Okay, let's uh, pick another crazy thing from here. Um, well, that one actually got its name changed later, so I want to do this. All right, so if white plays b4, the Polish opening, and black decides to defend with knight h6, what do we call the knight h6 defense? It's the Karnuski or Karnuski variation. Okay, um, so we've got all kinds of crazy names here for things in this book, things that I've never heard of. Uh, if uh, somebody plays the Dutch defense against you, and you play bishop g5 right away, hoping that he's going to weaken the white squares with h6, and then you can maybe checkmate him. For instance, h6, e, well, you, he can't, if he takes the bishop, he's, his rook's guarding the square, so he can't play e4, of course. But anyway, if you play bishop g5, he calls this the Hopton attack, the Hopton attack on bishop g5. Some of these names, as I said, changes over the years, but there's lots and lots and lots of, of names about this. All right. Um, when I first started out, if we talked about a standard set of opening moves, we called them the standard set of opening moves. Knight c6, bishop b5, a6, bishop a4, knight a6, castles, bishop e7, rook e1, b5, bishop b3, let's say castles, c3, d6, h3. These are the standard opening moves for the closed Roy Lopez. All right, but now instead of ca calling them the standard opening moves, we use the word, I guess it's an Italian word, although somebody wrote me and said it was not just Italian, um, called tabia. You learned the tabia, T-A-B-I-Y-A is how you spell tabia. So we learned the tabia. So we call these standard opening moves the tabia. Okay. Um, some, some words can have multiple meanings. For instance, we use the word pin a lot of times to mean... Um, a tactic pin where you're using you're pinning something to win material but you can also pin it just to lower its mobility where it's not the pin is not a tactic for instance after e5 e4 c5 knight f3 d6 let's say knight c3 knight c6 bishop to b5 this is not a tactic but it is a pin so the word pin both means it's a tactic or it could be a pin just to restrict in this case the knight on c6 can't move. All right, so pin sometimes, it's, the, it's like my word counting. My word counting as a tactic and the word pin have, are similar in the sense that you could do counting and it could come out even and therefore it's not a tactic, but you're still counting. And you could do a pin and, and you're not winning material, so it's not a tactic. And if you're counting and it's even, it's not a tactic. But if you're counting and it turns out that when you count you win material, then it is a tactic. So a lot of these words like pin or counting refer to types of tactics, but they also refer to the thing that you're doing that may or may not lead to a tactic, if that makes sense. So again, the way you're using the word in, in English uh, makes a difference. Let's talk about how, uh, how thinking in a certain way can kind of detract from what you're doing. Here's a position I talk about in one of my exercises and puzzles. Um, it's, I call this the Mong position, named after one of my son's friends who got played this game as white. And now black plays e4. And the question is, what should white do? And a lot of people, when they look at this position, the first thing they say is, I really don't want to retreat the knight to e1. Okay, the word retreat, if used in the English sense that way, is perfectly okay. But if you use it in the negative connotation sense of, of chess, where moving a piece to a lower rank toward yourself is a negative thing, then that's bad. You're giving the, the idea of moving the knight back to e1 a negative connotation by using the word retreat if you do that. And you have to be careful because if you say, I don't want to retreat, 
then a lot of times moving the piece back is just simply the best move. They don't want to do it because it's some sort of defeat for them. So therefore, they, they'd rather make a bad move going forward than a good move going backward because they don't want to retreat. It's like a psychologically bad thing. Now, if knight to e1 here was checkmate, if knight e1 checkmated the black king, somehow the black king was on c2 or something, and knight e1 was checkmate, then they wouldn't feel it was a retreat. You know, I'm sure we can set up a position like that pretty easy. Let's put a knight here. Let's put a king here. And now we have to checkmate him. All right, so we'll use another knight to block that square. And let's say we'll use a bishop to um, block these squares. And we got to block this square. So uh, let's put a rook over here. And we'll put a rook over here. And the white king could be anywhere. It doesn't matter. All right, did I do it right? Is knight to e1 checkmate here? Uh, we got d2 covered. We got d3 covered with the knight that's moving. We got c3 covered with the knight on e2. And we got d1 covered with the rook. Okay, so if you played knight e1 here, would you say I don't want to retreat my knight? No, because moving the knight there would make sense. You know, you're, you're checkmating him, so you're not worried about a retreat. In fact, the only pieces on the board that can't move backward are pawns, and that's when there's pawns on the board, that's where, where you are and how you're sitting makes, makes a difference. Once we take the, all the pawns off the board and we have a position like this, you could be sitting at any angle of the board, and it really doesn't matter because the pieces move the same. The only piece that moves in a direction uh, that matters is a pawn. Okay, now I've given things names to, to help people remember them. For instance, I've I made a whole video earlier about hope chess where I talk about you make a move and you don't check to see that on the next move if your opponent makes a check capture threat that you can safely meet it on your following move. I say if you don't do that consistently then you're playing hope chess because if he makes a threat you make a move and then he threatens you and you haven't checked it out already on the previous move then you're hoping that you'll that you'll make that next move safely. And that kind of has caught on and now people have used the word hope chess to mean more than that. They mean it to mean anything that you hope for in chess, which is one, not what I originally meant, but that's okay. If it, if it helps people remember or describe things, that's okay. And I've named quite a few things in chess to, to name things besides counting and hope chess. Let's talk about one or two. Um, there was a game I was going over the other day. It went something like this. D4, D5, Knight F3, Knight F6 e3, e6, bishop d3, c5, c3, bishop e7, castle, um, knight c6, knight bd2, and now black plays the common uh, inaccuracy, c4, taking the pressure off the d4 pawn, and white quickly played bishop to c2, which is correct, and now white's going to play the break move, going back to those names we were using earlier in the video, e4, and let's say black castles. So white wants to play e4 in this position. And the question is, should he play it right away? Let me ask Stockfish if e4 is the best move right away. Mr. Stockfish. Um, Mr. Stockfish says, yes, not only is e4 the best move right away, but it gives white such a big advantage that if both sides play perfectly, the white's practically winning. It's plus 1.5. It usually takes more than 1, 1 1.0 to have a winning position and here it's plus one point it's now it's down to 1.3 okay so so e4 is the right move but in the game white didn't play e4 right away he played queen to e2 and i have a name for this i say if someone plays a move to help prepare a move where they don't need to play that move i call that over preparation now if that sounds a little bit familiar a hundred years ago, when Aaron Nimzovich wrote his book, My System, he came up with an idea which is different but has a similar name called overprotection. So there's overprotection and there's overpreparation. Overprotection is a good thing. Overprotection is when you need to guard something and you guard it more times than necessary, which basically frees up all the pieces so that any of them can move if you need to. So Nimzovich gave it that name. He called it overprotection. Here, 
it, the, the name over pre preparation is actually usually a negative thing because you don't need to play the queen to e2. Maybe the queen has better things to do than to help prepare e4, which it doesn't need the help for. So here, over protection generally is good. Over preparation is generally bad. So I call this over preparation. I, gave an, I wanted to give a name to what someone was doing so that when people do it, I can say, no, no, that's over preparation. There's also a lot of things that, um, you know, Krogius gave names for for, for um, thought process mistakes. For instance, suppose we're looking at, um, problem, bring it up here. And we're asking, can white play knight takes e5? Is it safe? Sometimes my students say to me, no, it's not safe because after knight takes e5, black can pin it with queen e7. And then later on, he can keep piling on with moves like bishop to d6 and, and win the knight. And I say to them, you know, do you see what's wrong with your analysis? And they say, no. And then I say, let's try to play it. I want you to play exactly what you said. So I play knight takes e5. They play queen e7. And now I make a move to try to save it. Let's say, you know, f4 or something. And I say, go ahead and play that move bishop d6. And they say, I can't. And I say, why not? And they say, the queen's in the way. I said, but you said bishop d6. And they said, yeah. When I was looking at this position, the bishop could go to d6. And I I didn't visualize that the queen would be blocking it, even though I had to pin the knight first with the queen. Grandmaster Krogius, in his book Chess Psychology, called this a retained image error, because you retain the image of the bishop on, uh, sorry, of the queen on d8, and you don't see that it's on e7. And in the position that you're actually looking at, your board vision tells you that bishop d6 is a reasonable move. But you have to, it, your board vision isn't enough. Your board vision is what you're looking at with the move right away. In fact, board vision is something also that I call, other people call it chess vision. But it's the ability to look at a board and see what's happening. That's different than visualization, which is the name of keeping track of the pieces when you're moving them in your head. So if you think that you can play queen e7 and then later bishop d6, that's a visualization error that Graymaster Krogius calls a retained image error. Let's do one more, and that is... Suppose you're playing a king's Indian, and oops, help me set up the board. D4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7, e4, d6, bishop e2, castles. Suppose white plays the Averbach variation. Okay, why is this bishop on g5 okay? Well, there's two things it can do. In some lines, if, if black does nothing, white can play queen d2 and put the clamps on the h6 square, and then maybe he could even castle queen side and push up his pawns and attack, and that bishop attacking h6 could be a major possibility. On the other hand, if black decides to play e5, the bishop is pinning the knight on this diagonal, and there's putting pressure there on this h4 to d8 diagonal. So the fact Oops, let's go back to that position. D C4, G6, Knight C3, Bishop G7. Always good to practice your opening sequences to see how they got there. The fact that the bishop is good on both the H4 to D8 diagonal and on the C1 to H6 diagonal, I have a name for this. I call this a two-way bishop. A two-way bishop is one that's pr not primarily doing something in one direction, but in, in more than one direction, usually two directions. I mean, the bishop can go in four directions, but only two diagonals, so it depends on what you mean by the word direction. Again, an English thing. But here, I call this a two-way bishop. And when someone has a two-way bishop, you want to say to that bishop, Mr. Bishop, which way do you want to give me pressure? But I, I'm not going to let you do it both ways. And this already had a name before I called it a two-way bishop. The name for stopping a two-way bishop had a name. This is called putting the question to the bishop. So when someone has a two-way bishop, you want to put the question of the bishop. So we're actually using two sets of English terms to describe what's happening here. We're using Dan's term, two-way bishop, to describe why this bishop doesn't want to, you don't want this bishop to sit on g5. And then you want the traditional term that was made way before Dan's time, which is called putting the question to the bishop, which says, Mr. Bishop, where do you want to go? Do you want to keep putting the pressure on the knight versus the queen with bishop to h4 okay but now you're not going to pressure the h6 square 
Or if you want to keep pressuring the H6 square, you can. You can go back to E3, but now we don't have to worry about any pressure along the H8, sorry, the H4 to D8 diagonal from the knight to the queen. So we've got two-way bishop and then putting the question of the bishop. Well, I'm sure you can think of lots of other names of things that are given names in chess. Oh, let's do one more. I'm sorry. I thought this was going to be the last one. Charles Hurtan in his book, Power Chess for Kids, gives a name to, um, let's pull up one here, uh, examine. Um, eh, this is not a good example. Let's try one more. Yeah, this is a little more complicated. But here, it's white to play in with material. And the point is, it's, it's not the knight that's pinned here. It's the pawn that's pinned to the rook on f8. So what white can do to win material here is play rook takes e4. And if black plays queen takes e4, then queen takes e4. And after f takes e4, rook takes f8 check, and he wins material. If black, after rook takes e4, plays f takes e4 right away, then queen takes f8 wins material. So what white's doing is he's not attacking the pin pawn. He's attacking the square. Whoops, little trying to draw a line there. He's attacking the square that the pawn's not really guarding. Okay, so we're not really taking advantage of attacking pin pieces. We're attacking the squares that the pin piece is not really guarding. And Charles Hurtan in his book Power Chess for Kids calls this a sneaky pin. And this is a wonderful, wonderful name. Sneaky pins happen all the time. And training your eye to see sneaky pins is a really important part of becoming a decent chess player. So this idea of sneaky pin, I've always known it my whole life. I've always taken advantage of it. I never had a name for it till, till Charles Hurtan gave it a name. And I've been using that name ever since. And I really appreciate Hurtan picking up the fact that this did not have a name. And giving it a name helps you remember it and helps you describe it. So this is called a sneaky pin. And we'll do... One more sneaky pin here. I'll just set something up. Um, clear the board. Put a queen here. Put a rook here. Put a pawn here. Put a knight here. Put a rook here. Put a pawn here. Put a king here. Put a bishop here. Put a king here. Wait to play and win. Oh, how about queen takes g6. Sneaky pin, checkmate. All right, same idea. We're not attacking the pinned pawn here on f7. We're attacking the square that it's not really guarding, and we're capturing on that square. Queen takes g6 is mate. Okay, we're a little over on time here today, but we had some great stuff. I hope you enjoyed our talk about how names mean something in chess, and we name an awful lot of things in chess, and giving things names has meaning, whether it's retreat has a negative connotation or sneaky pin helping you remember. These names are important. We'll talk to you next time. If you like the channel, subscribe. We'll see you. Bye.